Well, you mentioned the Sharks, and we can kind of segue into that now. Um, in general, the first topic that we kind of have is, is the Sharks as a whole before mm-hmm. we get to talking about uh, a Sharks-adjacent topic, also a Bruins-adjacent topic. The Sharks officially finished winless in the month <laughs> of October. Not only winless... I think we're but having it like is, one goal a game, dude. It's so it is bad. Apathy. Literally yeah. at a goal per game pace through nine games with an 0-8 and one record with a uh, league leading, shall we say, negative goal differential. Really quickly, in terms of positive goal differential, there are three teams right now who are in double digits. You have the Vancouver Canucks at a plus 12. Which is, I mean, hey, they're they're one of the early stories. Five, two, and one yeah. for the first eight games. Not a bad start. The Boston Bruins at a plus fourteen with their seven zero and one record, and the Vegas Golden Knights with a plus fifteen goal differential at eight zero and one on the season. The bottom three: negative eleven for the Seattle Kraken with two wins in nine games. Very rough start for them, as we've mm-hmm. discussed. Calgary, who we just talked about, with a negative 15 in nine games played. And bringing up the rear, the San Jose Sharks with a negative 26 (laughs) goal differential (laughs) in nine games. You know, I didn't get a chance to see that 92 team, but here we are. (laughs) For those who don't get the reference, the 1992 San Jose Sharks finished with a record. Now, keep in mind, um, their first season, the inaugural Shark season in 91-92, they finished with a record of 17-58-5. The next year, 92-93, 11 wins, 71 losses, and two ties, I do believe at the time. Um, with uh, <clears throat> 17 losses in a row, including a game in which they scored first against Calgary and then lost the game 13 to 1. <laughs> oh, boy. This is maybe not on pace to be that bad. But at the same time, you can't necessarily rule it out. Like, it's tough to imagine in this era of parody, the Sharks not being able to win more than 11 games. But they legitimately have just one point through their first nine games from an overtime loss. Mm -hmm. This is looking tragic. Now, they're going to improve slightly when Logan Couture comes back from injury. But it's it's really bad. We're gonna we're gonna pick up some wins though because the one bright spot. Well, there's a couple bright spots, but one of the largest bright spots as a team, like in the on the whole, I can't even really say team. It's Mackenzie Blackwood. Um, <laughs> he's been really good. Like his goal, his 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 goal saved above expert, expected is unreal. The mm-hmm. Sharks. I looked at a I looked at a chart. We're actually top ten in goals saved above expected. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So just to <laughs> just, just even Blackwood. Sim- yeah, to, well, to simplify it though, they're two goaltenders. Blackwood has a three eight four goals against average co- in six games. Kokkinen has a three seventeen in four appearances. So obviously there was a, a game where they swapped mm-hmm. goaltenders. Both of them have identical nine oh seven save percentages. Yeah, three to four goals a game, but they are both still over a nine hundred save percentage. On the season, that goes to show that they are getting shelled. They are under constant threat, game in and game out, and are standing on their heads just to keep the Sharks from losing every game 5-1-5-0. Yeah. And uh, another bright spot, which uh, this guy's going to go unnoticed until the Sharks are kind of good. But if you you watch the games, he... 
he is he's growing in leaps and bounds as a player. Uh, William Eklund mm. has been absolutely unreal, is not getting the points to show for it simply because no one on this team can finish. Uh, and also because Quinn is obsessed with playing him on the third line with Luke Cunning and someone else that rotates in and out, but he's keeping him with Luke Cunning this whole time. Sure. Mm. Um, but Eklund had this shift against, um, I think it was Carolina, where it, for about a good 20, 15, 20 seconds, maybe even more, but I think it was like, yeah, 20 seconds at least, where he was possessing the puck in the offensive zone and fighting off, you know, cross checks and slashes from Brady Shea. He d- went around the horn in the entire zone, was working the boards, and he couldn't, it, no one got open. The poor kid is in there. Like t- completely taking over a shift in the offensive zone, and he has no one to pass to, and that perfectly kind of summarizes kind Medium of the Sharks season. Medium release, the ASHL ability. <laughs> yeah, that too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was just like he's looking so good, and he had this. He had another b- brilliant pass in the game against Washington, where he gets it down low at the net corner, sends it like a blind pass, like between his legs that goes right to look Luke Cunning in the slot. Who's unable to bury it. And the, the, and these are not isolated. Like it once a game, he'll have a beautiful feed or two that can't be finished. And I'm, I'm very, very happy with the way that he's been looking Bordalo, Unfortunately, hasn't quite gotten, gotten going. He got sent back down now, but William Eklund is looking like the player that we drafted him for. The points will come, but it's going to be really painful this year. And I, I don't understand why Quinn is not giving him a shot on the first line. He's gotten zero time playing with Hurdle this entire season. And I'm like, you're seeing what he's doing. Why don't you give him a shot on the top line? And mm. that's just the David fucking Quinn thing where he keeps playing like Duclair and Hoffman and Barabanov with Hurdle. And uh, yeah, meanwhile, looking <sighs> on cap yeah. friendly right now, uh, which was updated before last night's game, I'm actually going to uh, double check through daily face off as well to see um, what these line combinations are listed. And I just want to make sure that there's the consistency uh, between the two and it looks like it. So the mm-hmm. Sharks lines right now, top line is listed as Duclair, who has one goal in nine games. Yeah, His top line, point. sure. Tomas Hurdle, five points, four assists in the nine games. And Fabian Zetterland, who was tied for the team's lead uh, goal scorer mark with two goals in nine games. He deserves it. He's been he's been a fucking horse out there. Their second line is Eklund, Mikhail Granlund, who's only played two games this year, started off the season injured, and Luke Kunin, which is uh Yeah. Third line, Zadina, Nico Sturm, and Mike Hoffman. Hoffman with one assist in nine games. He's been so bad, dude. So fucking bad. And the fourth line of Giovanni Smith, Ryan Carpenter, and Kevin LeBanc. Kevin LeBanc, by the way, who makes 4725 against the cap, has no points in six games. Yep. He's looked good some games, but Quinn does not like him. <laughs> mm. He does make some bonehead passes sometimes, man. But like when you're lacking offense, stop putting him on the fourth line. You have Cunning on the second. Ah, yeah. It just feels like it's probably more painful right now for Sharks fans than it has to be. Like it can yeah. still be that situation that you were rooting for at the start of the year. Let's be bad, but let's see some bright spots. And right now, it's it's more difficult to find those bright spots than it should be. Yeah. Because you are limited to William Eklund, Hurdle trying his best. <laughs> Zadina has some bright spots here. Like, Yeah, he, he's had some really good games, but then other games he's invisible. Mm. Um, that's unfortunate. But, man, when he looks good, he's he flies around the ice. So if he can develop some kind of consistency. But, yeah, the most consistency has come from William Eklund, which is hilarious. And the way I mean that is, like, he's consistently improved his game. And he's starting to become more vocal. And mm. he's, you know, he when he says something, like, he'll say something in an interview. He's like, he's like I just want to play hockey out there. I want to get the puck. I want to possess the puck. I want to make plays. And he goes out there and he fucking does it. And the, he was drafted as, you know, a future guy who could be a leader on this team. And we're starting to see it at the age of 21. 
Again, mm-hmm. the points will come. I'm just hoping he doesn't get like a huge knock in his confidence. But the way he keeps continues to get better, and the way like he continues to really start to control the pace of play and really take over the offensive zone is a good sign. It's just you know you're you're always you're obviously nervous. It's like fuck, man. What if he's just like fuck this? Get me out of here at some point, or like just as like no one's finishing these passes because in, in so many ways with his vision. He reminds me legitimately of Jumbo. He's a, he's a different player, but the passes that he makes are fucking unreal sometimes. I don't know how he sees them. Like, I don't know how he, how he knows that that player's there. And he, it's, yeah. Well, I'm excited for the idea that 24 years from now, William Eklund is going to retire <laughs> on social media with a gigantic beard and no shirt. Yes. God, I miss Jumbo. Joe Thornton has officially retired from the NHL after 24 seasons. Obviously, he has not played for a little bit now, but um, this this was this was an interesting kind of moment in time because I feel like right now, for me as a uh, as a Boston sports fan in particular. I've had those moments over the last few years of like, okay, David Ortiz has retired. Tom Brady left and then retired. Zidane Char is retired. Bergeron just retired. Um, but there was still something about this where it really kind of hit of like, ah, oh, fuck, Joe Thornton's not an active player anymore. And I think it's a um, good friend of the, the podcast, uh, one X-Tech, who put out his thoughts about the retirements um, where he's just like, oh, God, I'm old. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Quote, seeing Jumbo retire means my childhood is officially over. It's done. I'm old. <laughs> and that's that's how it feels. I mean, this was a guy that, again, like I mentioned, 24 seasons between the Bruins, who took him first overall in 1997, the Sharks, where obviously he played the vast majority of his career. And then over 1,100 the games. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's Since so at the nuts. end with Tampa and uh, not Tampa, Toronto and Florida, excuse me, um, 430 goals, 1,109 assists for 1,539 points in 1,714 career games played. Um, this is despite... <laughs> For, for me, at least, who knows? There might be some debate. Um, for me, despite the lack of team-based hardware, um, and despite just a lone Art Ross and Hart Trophy, which came in 2005-2006 as the leading point scorer in league MVP, uh, Joe Thornton, to me, is a first ballot Hall of Famer. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, he was one of the NHL's stalwart players for years, even as he began to get up there in age, you know, we're talking about his age 36 season in 2015, 16, he was a point per game player. And he, the only player that had more points than him in this, like the second half stretch of the season was Sidney Crosby. I re- I, re- mm. I read a stat like that, like the last 50 games or whatever, or something like that. Like he was like well over point per game. Another f- cr- ridiculous stat is that after he got traded to the sharks, like, he was scoring at like almost McDavid levels after mm. when, when that trade happened and he went through and he went to the Sharks and he had that heart and Art, Art Ross season. I mean, he had what was it, 90 something assists that year? Or was or was that just with the when he got traded to the Sharks? I, I can't had, remember, but it he was had two seasons with 90 assists <laughs> or more. Yeah, like <laughs> the man is man was absurd and yeah and i remember that like renaissance of joe thorn when he just went absolutely nuts down the stretch and and it's so sad like that we he didn't doesn't have a cup just in general you know i was hoping when he started chasing it and i'm like just please win man you deserve it it's not going to be with us mm-hmm. obviously and but yeah i mean there's the chance the 2016 unfortunately you ran into pretty much a team that wasn't going to be beat that year and yeah. they proved it by winning back to back the next year against Nashville too. the 2019 run into the conference finals where it seemed like for once calls were going our way we were getting favorable reviews and I'm like wait a second is the world coming together 
And then because for the first time in a long time, everyone hated the Sharks because we were getting calls and reviews our way. You know, it was a, that was the five minute major, the offsides yeah. review against Colorado. <laughs> And then the fucking hand pass against St. Louis, which ended up being the death knell because then St. Louis came out and headshotted everyone on the team, uh, mm, knocked out gotcha. Hurdle. Uh, Hurdle got injured. They fucked up our defensive core. It, yeah. And so that was yeah, after that hand pass, St. Louis didn't lose against us. So, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just so many close calls. It's funny, too, because you talk about like his playoff performance and that was part of what led to the trade in the first place was during his time with the Bruins. He was labeled as a guy who does not step up in the playoffs, particularly his last playoff series with the Bruins. Oh, three, oh, four. First round, they lose to Montreal. No points in seven games and a minus six. Yeah. So the narrative was, you know, here's a guy who had put up points in the playoffs in the past. But this is our leader. He's not getting it done. And then the next thing you know, after the 4 5 lockout, he starts the 5 6 season with the Bruins, gets traded to the Sharks in November, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and then plays in 11 playoff games with San Jose that year, puts up nine points. And then all of a sudden, you can look at his, his playoff history, and he does very, very well. Like, as a Shark, 144 career playoff games with 115 points. Um, that is pretty goddamn solid. And in his career in general, 134 points in 187 playoff games. Like, I don't think like he's not the most prolific playoff scorer of all time. You got to remember when he started and what era we were playing through too. Like, yes, scoring went up after the 05 lockout, but it's, it wasn't close to the point we're at now. Right. Like it, it it went up for a few years and then it kind of came back down for a while. Remember, I mean, remember the season Jamie Ben was the highest point scorer with like just barely point per game up. or whatever. Like mm-hmm. what year is that? I feel like that was the mid teens. It was. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm looking it up really quickly because I want to make sure we uh, I want to make sure we get that right. But that is the the most infamous one for the Art Ross trophy is and and just to elaborate here on this right let's talk about this joe thornton won the art ross in 0506 like i mentioned with 125 points <laughs> which is hilarious that is that was the most points an art ross trophy winner had between 05 and 06 all the way up to 2019 when nikita kucherov put up 128 yeah and there's still only three other players uh excuse me four Post 05 lockout to have 120 points in the season. Sidney Crosby, Nikita Kucherov, and Connor McDavid now twice in a row. That's the company that he's in in terms of scoring. And looking back at the Art Ross winners, 05 06, all the way to 2012, the Art Ross winner always had at least 104 points in a season. The 12 13 seasons, the outlier, because it was a lockout shortened year. So San Luis had 60 points. Mm-hmm. The next year, uh, Sidney Crosby won it with over 100 points. And then 2014 15, Jamie Benn wins it with 87. And then it goes back up to at least players with 100. There were some inconsistencies in those years in scoring. And you got to remember, too, at the time. You had rule changes out of the 0405 lockout, some rule changes out of the 2012 13 lockout that cost them half a season, and then continual changes to goalie pad size mm-hmm. and, and stuff like that. Um, it, the old joke again of hockey is a great sport when it's finished. And Joe Thornton is a constant at the NHL level of production despite all of these consistent changes. Yeah. He Even is... more impressive when you consider towards the end of his career, uh, when the game continued to get faster and faster and faster. And he was never a, a fast skater. <laughs> uh, he was good on his blades. Like, you fucking good luck knocking him off the puck. And he had pretty damn Yager-esque. good agility. Yeah. And he was, he had really good agility, like, uh, like underrated agility, especially in the corners. And that helped him to make all the passes that he did. But. Yeah, but then also, again, he had some deceptive uh, straight line speed. I remember on this one back check, I can't remember who he caught up to, but it was a pretty fast skater. And he back checked up and lifted his stick and took the puck. And it's Joe Thornton on the back, mm. back check doing that 30 at age 35 plus. <laughs> <laughs> 
so he could he could you know he could skate when he wanted to it just wasn't the the you know wasn't that part of his game really like yeah. what a, what a I, man though i think to the longevity uh he is sixth all time in games played in the nhl um only behind and he's of the six they're all in the 1700s he's only behind ron francis yermir yager mark messier gordy howe and patrick marlow who of course is the all-time leader in games played one of the very few of course to have played 24 seasons or more i mean the company that he's in there is alex del vecchio chara uh yager messier chris chelios gordy howe i mean his longevity was insane he is seventh all time in assists um, in the 1100 club um, alongside paul coffee yager bork messier francis gretzky um and he's I believe, yeah, top 10, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. He's 12th all time in points. Mm -hmm. um, only behind, and I, I'm going to keep saying the names to emphasize, like, he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. Bork, mm -hmm. Esposito, Sackick, Lemieux, Iserman, Marcel Dion, Francis Howe, Messier, Yager, Gretzky. Those are the only all players in there. who have put up <laughs> more points than Joe Thornton in the NHL. Not a I top mean, 100 player, though. <laughs> mm -hmm. I they, they felt Duncan not... Keith had to be in there. <sighs> Fucking morons. I do not like to reference this. Um because yeah, that was a thing where the NHL what was it for the centennial season, right? Yeah, I believe so. Put out their list of the one hundred greatest players of all time. They and, had Kane um, and Taves and Keith in there. And pretty sure Seabrook too. <laughs> I'm trying to find the list because if you search NHL all time 100 players, obviously you get certain articles that are out there. Um, okay, I think I found it. Uh, yeah, it was the centennial season for 2017. The 100 greatest players of all time. And... Um, there's no Joe Thornton. There's no Patrick Marlowe. <laughs> um, there are a lot of fan bases that support a lot of teams that could be like, uh, where the hell's this guy? Um, there were there were a lot of them. But yeah, especially at the time in the aftermath of three straight cups for the Hawks, there was uh, there was some Hawks bias um, within the, the voting. That's, That's crazy. Sure. That's cr Hawks bias from the NHL? No way. Mm. Mm. Huh. Yeah. It's funny, though, that Eric Lindros made the list. Because you'd think the biggest takeaway for... I loved Eric Lindros, by the way. He's one of my favorite players of all time. Um, he never won a cup. So you'd think that would have been one of the big takeaways for him. Because clearly it was one of the big takeaways for other players. Yeah. Um, But they put Lindros in there. On that list. Lindros, no jumbo. Imagine. I'm still getting Duncan Keith and no jumbo. Fucking hell. The nature of that list was always bound to cause some division amongst people. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it um, it didn't go over well at the time. Just, and it didn't age well in the first uh, place. Nah, the dick writing's insane, though. Like, <sighs> That's just how it felt when I was looking at that list. Like, is Seabrook on there? I know Keith is on there, but if Seabrook's on there, I'm gonna lose my fucking shit. Like, oh, look at back here. holy crap! Keith is on the list confirmed. No Brent Seabrook though. Mm, thank goodness. Okay. Taves, yeah. Kane, and Keith did make fucking it lol that Taves and Keith are in there. Yeah, but three cops. Think of the leadership. Uh, yeah. That really never, you know, came into question later on. No, no, it didn't, did it? Hi, Hawks fans. Hi. We, yeah, we, we love you guys. You, you have Connor Bedard have... now. We're all salty. <clears throat> Shouldn't have had the pick though. 